Welcome to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's meeting of its Credit Union Advisory Council, or CUAC. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is an independent federal agency whose mission is to help consumer finance markets work by making rules more effective, by consistently and fairly enforcing those rules, and by empowering consumers to take more control over their economic lives. My name is Zixta Martinez. I'm the Associate Director for the External Affairs Division at the CFPB. Today's meeting is being held at the CFPB's headquarters in Washington, D.C. This is the QAC's first meeting of the year, and as always, we have a packed schedule. Today's meeting is being recorded and will be available at consumerfinance.gov. You can also follow CFPB on Twitter and Facebook. Let me spend a few minutes telling you about what you can expect at today's meeting. First, I'll introduce the Bureau's QAC members. Then the CFPB's director, Richard Cordray, will provide opening remarks. Following the director's remarks, the QAC vice chair, Robin Romano, will conduct the meeting on behalf of QAC chair, Kevin Foster Getty, who was unable to attend today's public meeting. Vice Chair Romano will then introduce Chris D'Angelo, the Bureau's Chief of Staff, who will lead a discussion about the CFPB's priorities. Following the discussion about the Bureau's priorities, the QAC will hear from Stacey Cannon and Naomi Karp, subject matter experts with the Bureau's Office of Older Americans. The two will lead a discussion about elder financial abuse. The meeting will then adjourn at approximately 4.30 p.m. The Bureau established a Credit Union Advisory Council to include representatives of credit unions from across the U.S. The QAC is charged with providing substantive information, analysis, operational expertise, knowledge of their communities, and feedback to inform the Bureau's work. Today's public meeting and discussion is in support of this important responsibility. As a reminder, the views of the QAC members are their views. They're greatly appreciated and welcome, yet they do not represent the views of the CFPB. So let's get started with an introduction of our QAC members. I would ask our members to raise your hand as I call your name. The chair is Kevin Foster Ketty. Kevin is president and CEO of Washington State Employee Credit Union in Olympia, Washington. The vice chair is Robin Romano. Robin is CEO of Marisol Federal Credit Union, a CDFI credit union in Phoenix, Arizona. Gail DeBoer is president and CEO of SAC Federal Credit Union in Papillion, Nebraska. Bob Donnelly is executive vice president of Members Credit Union in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Robert Falk is President and CEO of Purdue Federal Credit Union in West Lafayette, Indiana. Gregory Higgins is Senior Vice President, Chief Administration Officer, and General Counsel of Wings Financial Credit Union in Apple Valley, Minnesota. Jason Lee is Executive Vice President and CFO for Orion Federal Credit Union in Memphis, Tennessee. Robin Loftus is COO of Heartland Credit Union in Springfield, Illinois. James McDaniel is President and CEO of Heritage Trust Federal Credit Union in Charleston, South Carolina. Carrie O'Connor is Chief Lending Officer for Community America Credit Union in Lenexa, Kansas. Thomas O'Shea is President and CEO of Aspire Federal Credit Union in Clark, New Jersey. Katie Profke is Assistant Vice President and Compliance Officer for Chevron Federal Credit Union in Oakland, California. David Seeley is President and CEO of Kirtland Federal Credit Union in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Jim Spradlin is president and CEO of, Mar of Park Community Credit Union in Louisville, Kentucky. And last but certainly not least, 
Bernie Wynn is president and CEO of the Boston Firefighters Credit Union in Dorchester, Massachusetts. We also have with us Delicia Hand, who is the CFPB staff director for the Bureau's advisory board and council's office. I'm now pleased to introduce Richard Cordray. Prior to his current role as the CFPB's first director, he led the CFPB's enforcement office. Before that, he served on the front lines of consumer protection as Ohio's Attorney General. In this role, he recovered more than $2 billion for Ohio's investors, retirees, and business owners, and took major steps to help protect its consumers from fraudulent foreclosures and financial predators. Before serving as Attorney General, he also served as Ohio State Representative, Ohio Treasurer, and Franklin County Treasurer. Director Cordray. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Zixta Martinez, and also Delisa Hand, who, who, as Zixta mentioned, runs our boards and councils. And I want to welcome all of you to this meeting of the Credit Union Advisory Council. Uh, it's now been four years that we have uh, had this advisory group working with us uh, and helping us. Uh, this is uh, a group of leaders that are uh, as knowledgeable about this business as anyone around. They come from all over the country. They have different backgrounds and experiences and different perspectives, uh, and they share those perspectives with us. That's important because we recognized early on that we had certain gaps in our vision about what was going on in the financial marketplace. Uh, one gap was community banks because we don't have the opportunity to supervise them under the, the statute as it was drawn up. We don't supervise institutions of less than $10 billion, uh, in assets on, on the depository side. Uh, and the same was true of credit unions. Uh, it's only about five credit unions out of the thousands of credit unions across the country that we have any kind of day-to-day -day experience with because we can examine them and supervise their operations. So we wanted to have the chance to have perspective and insight uh, from, from uh, credit union leaders from around the country, and that's why we created this council. We're at a point now in our evolution where some certain members of the council are cycling off because we do have a rotating membership, uh, which is always a, a point of sadness for us. Uh, but new members are coming on, uh, and they continue to maintain the same level of quality uh, and insight and perspective, and we are very grateful to them for taking time away from running their institutions to spend some of it with us and to help inform uh, our work. Uh, so today I want to talk about two things. The first is uh, the issue of prioritization for the Bureau itself and for our work. Uh, and I would say that at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, we advise all consumers to set goals and make plans to meet them. We believe the same should be true for the Bureau itself. If we want markets where good information allows consumers to make smart financial decisions, where consumers can choose among the costs and risks of various financial products successfully, and where good service gives consumers all they reasonably can ask for, then we should first map out how we plan to get there. In 2011, when we first opened our doors, we laid out two broad strategic objectives to guide our work. The first objective was delivering tangible value to consumers. That's always been first and foremost for us. By following through on our statutory responsibility to clean up the practices that led to the collapse of the economy and caused so much harm to everyday Americans. It also meant monitoring consumer financial markets so we could see developments as they occur in real time and head off problems that might arise in the future. The second objective, and it's been a constant for us uh, over the last five years, was building a great institution by putting in place the basic infrastructure of this new agency, which we were required to build from scratch, from the ground up, including the personnel and the strategy and the processes and the tools necessary to accomplish the purposes that Congress had set for us. Those tools include supervision, enforcement, rulemaking, research, consumer education, and the handling of consumer complaints. As we do all of this more and more, as we do our actual work, we can see that we're succeeding in delivering tangible value for consumers. 
Over the past year, we've been engaged in a particularly intensive effort to prioritize how we use our tools to tackle the most troubling problems facing consumers. Uh, often with a problem, we have a tool choice. We can attack it through supervision or through enforcement or through rulemaking, or maybe we should use multiple tools. The result of this work that we have done is that we have set uh, a group of near-term priority goals and a plan for how to deploy our shared cross-bureau resources, our multiple tools, to achieve these goals. While these goals do not capture all the important work we're doing, we have a lot of work streams now that are, that are close to full maturity in a number of different ways. The nine goals that I will lay out here represent key areas where we hope to make substantial progress over the next two years. They are statements we're making about particular outcomes in particular markets that we want to drive toward fulfilling. Rather than descriptions of what tools we plan to use, which is something we will continue to uh, contemplate and figure out as we go. Uh, the nine uh, priority areas are, uh, and the way, the way we're wording this, is we envision markets that perform better for consumers in the following ways. First, we envision a mortgage market where lenders serve the entire array of creditworthy borrowers fairly and where servicers have processes in place that result in fair and efficient outcomes for consumers. Second, we envision a student loan market where student loans are serviced in a way that is transparent and fair to help students repay their debts. Third, we envision a credit reporting market with better data that is more accurate and inclusive of more consumers. Fourth, we envision a market that is free, all markets that are free from discrimination and where consumers have equal access to small business lending. Fifth, we envision a market where consumers are savvy about their own finances and they have reliable places to turn for the tools and skill building that they need to increase their own financial capability. Sixth, we envision a market where consumer education and policy decisions about household finances are based on a deep understanding of how households use financial products and make choices about money and the effects on their lives. Seventh, we envision an open-use credit market where payday and installment lenders rely on business models that succeed when consumers use credit as needed, and are able to repay their debts when they come due. Eighth, we envision a debt collection market where everyone who collects debts substantiates the debts they're collecting and communicates with debtors about their debts in a respectful, lawful, consumer-oriented manner. Ninth, and finally, we envision an entire consumer financial marketplace where consumers will have the ability to effectuate their rights and hold institutions accountable for unlawful conduct. While these goals focus our shared cross-bureau efforts for the future, we continue to dedicate resources so that we can follow through on a few priority work streams that are well-established and ongoing, such as our fair lending oversight of indirect auto lenders and our rulemaking on prepaid cards. Today, we're going to focus also on a second subject, and this concerns the special needs and circumstances of older Americans. We are devoting great efforts to protecting them from financial exploitation, promoting their economic security, and educating both them and those who care for them about potential dangers. In fact, our Office for Older Americans is the only arm of the federal government specifically dedicated to the financial health of our seniors. This is an increasingly important subject in the United States. 57 million Americans are now age 62 or older, and another 10,000 Americans join them every day. Many of these Older Americans face threats from financial predators that can harm the unprepared and unprotected. Elder financial exploitation has been rightly called the crime of the 21st century, and fighting it has never been more urgent. Though this topic has been the most common form of elder abuse, it is also one of the least reported. When seniors fall victim to a scam or theft by a family member, they may be too embarrassed or too frail to pursue legal action or even to report that they've suffered harm. So it's crucial that others know how to look out for them. Over the past few years, members of our Credit Union Advisory Council have often highlighted to us that credit unions and other small financial institutions may be the first to be alerted to fraud and other predatory activities. And we should be grateful to them for that. This is, this is because they know their customers well and often have more opportunity to deal with older consumers face to face when they engage in transactions. These institutions are also uniquely positioned to detect when an elder account holder has been targeted or victimized. 
Yesterday, the Consumer Bureau released an advisory and specific recommendations to help financial institutions prevent, recognize, and report financial abuse. The team members in our Office for Older Americans have traveled the country listening to the concerns of seniors. They've listened to people sharing their experiences and stories of their elder customers. Based on what we have heard, we've issued studies, guides, and advisories to arm seniors and their caregivers with the information and tools they need to protect themselves and their precious retirement savings. The advisory we released yesterday contains specific recommendations to banks and credit unions about how they can act to prevent or halt the financial abuse of seniors. It highlights the opportunities for financial institutions to protect older consumers from abuse and exploitation. I'm particularly pleased, as the members of this council have shared with us over the years, that many of you are already taking some of the steps we included in the advisory, which we consider best practices, or you're considering other ways to protect your senior customers. We appreciate your willingness to share your knowledge and expertise with us so that we can tackle together this important issue. And we will continue our work to ensure older Americans have the economic security they need and the peace of mind they deserve. We know that the members of our Credit Union Advisory Council have valuable insights to offer on these topics and many more, and that's why each of you was chosen from among many applicants for these positions. As we look ahead and work toward the primary goals we've set for ourselves, we're intent upon constantly and tenaciously pushing forward to make progress on behalf of consumers. In maintaining this outlook and approach, we're always seeking to learn, grow, and get better at what we do. So thank you for being here today, and we look forward to a vigorous discussion. Thank you, Director Cardray. My name is Robin Romano. I am the Vice uh, Chairman of the Credit Union Advisory Council. Welcome to our public and welcome members to our very first 2016 public session. The CFPB organized this council in 2012, as we've heard, to regularly hear from credit unions from all over the country, large and small, and it, I believe it's been a very productive exercise. Our council has provided an opportunity for credit unions to raise emerging issues uh, facing them and to share their input, often very passionately, and perspectives on the Bureau's work to protect uh, consumers. So today, we're going to hear from council members and the Bureau on their strategic priorities, and you will also hear from council members as they respond to advisory and recommendations on how all financial institutions can protect elderly customers from financial exploitation and abuse. So first up, we're going to hear from CFPB staff, Chris D'Angelo, who serves as the Bureau Chief of Staff on the agency's strategic outlook for the next year to 18 months. And then we're going to shift our conversation over to uh, council members for their perspectives, and then we're going to have a talk about elderly abuse. So Chris? Thank you very much, Vice Chair Romano, and thank you to all of the Credit Union Advisory Council members for giving us the opportunity to come speak with you today about the Bureau's two-year strategic outlook. I also want to thank Zixta Martinez and Delicia Hand for their great work and all of their staff's great work in preparing this event. They know a lot goes into it. And I want to thank Director Cordray for introducing this topic in his opening remarks. I'll build on the director's remarks in my presentation, first providing a brief overview of the strategic planning process, and then walk through each of our nine priority goals, why we believe each of those goals is important, and how we intend to achieve them over the next two years. As the director articulated in his opening remarks, we had, when we opened our doors in 2011, there were two strategic objectives that have guided our work. The first was to deliver tangible value to consumers through data-driven policy work and rigorous law enforcement. The second is to build a great institution, one that attracts great talent and is designed to be sustainable and enduring. In assessing how we might achieve that first objective, delivering tangible value for consumers, we have focused on four industry-wide problems, which the director first articulated in a 2013 speech to our Consumer Advisory Board. Those are, first, deception, or situations where costs and risks of financial decisions are obscured or opaque. Second, debt traps, or practices that trigger a cycle of debt where consumers rack up substantial costs over time. Third, dead ends, or situations where people cannot vote with their feet when they are treated unfairly. And fourth, discrimination, or unequal treatment based on characteristics such as race, 
gender, and other bases that are prohibited by law. We find no shortage of these problems in the market and have found it necessary to prioritize how we limit our, how we use our limited resources most effectively. In developing our priority goals over the next two years, we assessed the four problems that we just identified across all markets and within each of those markets, prioritized them based on the extent of the consumer harm and our capacity to eliminate or mitigate that harm. The result is a set of nine near-term priority goals where we hope to make substantial progress over the next two years and a plan for how we will deploy our shared cross-bureau resources to do so. Before I jump into the nine goals themselves, I want to say a few brief things about the process, which we named our one bureau planning process internally. This is a ground-up process that involved over 200 staff from around the organization. And we, when we designed the process, we designed it to have four very important features. The first was to think about the outcomes that we want to achieve as opposed to the specific things that we want to do. The second was to make sure that we built then a, an interdisciplinary plan that pulled from all of our tools to try to accomplish those outcomes. The third was to make sure that the process was feeding into our budget so that we made sure that we prioritized our resources to account for our highest priority work. And the fourth was to create a common vocabulary for our staff to aid them in prioritizing their work on a day-to-day -day basis and creating a sustainable work environment. One last point before I ju jump into the priority goals themselves. I want to uh, clarify one thing which is important to us, is that the goals themselves do not encapsulate all of the important work that we're doing here at the Bureau, and there are a few very important pieces that we will continue to focus on. One is continuing to build a strong organization by achieving operational excellence. Two is continuing to fill our, fulfill our mandate to police all markets within our jurisdiction for compliance with consumer financial laws and regulations. Third, maintaining a robust ability to understand and monitor markets through research and other market monitoring. And fourth, continuing to intake consumer complaints, which help us prioritize our work and keep an eye on emerging issues. And now for our priority goals. We've listed them in alphabetical order, not in any priority order. And it's important to note, again, that for each of these goals, it's not that we've prioritized an entire market, but rather identified an outcome or a set of outcomes that we hope to achieve in our goal statement. The first goal relates to arbitration. In recent years, many contracts for consumer financial products and services have included pre-dispute arbitration clauses, stating that either party can require that disputes be resolved through arbitration rather than through the court system. The CFPB envisions a consumer financial marketplace where consumers have the ability to effectuate their rights and hold institutions accountable for unlawful conduct. We believe this is important in part because the CFPB's arbitration study found widespread use of pre-dispute arbitration clauses for a variety of products. We found that over 90% of the arbitration agreements that we studied expressly prohibited class arbitrations. And moreover, three out of four consumers who were surveyed did not know that they were subject to an arbitration clause. The CFPB's arbitration study found that consumers rarely bring individual lawsuits and that class actions are an effective way to enable large numbers of consumers to secure relief with small, for small dollar claims. We will achieve this goal by continuing the rulemaking process and proposing a rule that's consistent with our study that will further enable consumers to effectuate their rights and hold institutions accountable for unlawful conduct. Our second goal relates to consumer reporting. Consumer reporting companies play a key role in the financial lives of consumers. The reports that the three largest consumer reporting companies sell are used in determining everything from consumer eligibility for credit, eligibility for employment and housing, service member eligibility for security clearances. The CFPB envisions a consumer reporting system where furnishers provide and consumer reporting companies maintain and distribute data that are accurate and inclusive of more consumers. We believe this goal is important because roughly 26 million consumers lack a credit report, which makes it difficult for those consumers to obtain credit from mainstream lenders. Additionally, according to the FTC, roughly 20% of consumers who participated in a 2012 study had an error in at least one of their credit reports, and 5% had errors of a magnitude that could negatively impact their score and result in less favorable loan terms. We intend to achieve this goal 
by continuing our supervisory and enforcement work of consumer reporting companies and furnishers, focusing in particular on the accuracy of those consumer reporting uh, networks. We will also use the information we gather to assess options for cooperatively involving consumer, uh, cooperatively improving consumer reporting data. And based on this work, the Bureau may consider additional rulemaking around furniture and consumer reporting accuracy, dispute resolution, and other related issues. The Bureau is also exploring how alternative data is or can be used in the consumer reporting system to improve access to financial services. Our third goal relates to debt collection. The CFPB envisions a debt collection market where everyone who collects debts substantiates those debts accurately identifies debtors, provides debtors with appropriate information, and communicates with debtors about their debts in a respectful, lawful, and consumer-oriented way. This goal is important in part because the Bureau receives its highest volume of complaints, around 80,000 per year, from consumers in the area of collections. In addition, co consumers often have limited resources or opportunities to address collections-related issues. We intend to achieve this goal by initiating a rulemaking process that will establish clear rules of the road to ensure that debt collectors, both, both first-party debt collectors and third-party debt collectors, treat consumers with dignity and respect, obtain and retain the information necessary to substantiate the debts they collect on, and provide consumers with appropriate information about their rights. In addition, the Bureau's rulemaking activity will be complemented by rigorous supervision and enforcement to ensure that institutions are held accountable for fulfilling their current obligations and eventually by ensuring that institutions comply with any new rules that are promulgated. The Bureau's fourth goal relates to demand-side consumer behavior. An essential part of the CFPB mission is to empower consumers to take control over their financial lives and to improve their financial well-being. The CFPB envisions a marketplace where community and public service providers integrate financial capability skill building into their educational and service programs, and consumers are aware of and have access to trusted tools and resources to make and act on critical financial decisions. This goal is important in part because a 2014 survey showed that only half of Americans feel that they are financially secure. The amount spent in the United States on financial education is dwarfed by the amount spent on consumer financial marketing. For every dollar spent on financial education a year, roughly $25 is spent on consumer financial marketing. We will achieve our goal here by continuing to create consumer financial decision-making tools, like our paying for college tool, our owning a home tool, and our saving for retirement tool. We will continue to build awareness of those tools. We will work to provide support to social service providers youth services, and K-12 through organizations to ensure that more consumers are able to build financial, uh, build financial skills and will conduct foundational research that financial educators can use to raise the effectiveness of educational services. Our fifth goal relates to household balance sheets and our research agenda. The lives of American consumers are complex and their financial decisions are influenced by many factors. These decisions sometimes impact their financial well-being for years to come, and current research often yields insights into only individual financial choices and rarely offers a glimpse of the household's entire balance sheet over time. The CFPB envisions policymaking and consumer education based on a deeper understanding of the evolution of a household's balance sheet and how households use financial products over time. This is important in part because most current research addresses credit products or financial decisions only in isolation without considering each consumer's full set of assets and liabilities. We'll achieve this goal by initiating a research program aimed at better understanding the factors that promote or inhibit financial health of households by researching the dynamics of household balance sheets over time. Our sixth goal relates to mortgages. With a market size of approximately $10 trillion, the mortgage market is far and away the largest consumer credit market. For most consumers, a mortgage is a necessary step in the path to home ownership. Here, the CFPB envisions a mortgage market where lenders serve the entire array of creditworthy borrowers fairly 
and in a non-discriminatory manner, where servicers' processes result in a fair and efficient outcome for consumers, and where new mortgage rules are implemented in a manner that supports a sustainable mortgage market. We believe this goal is important in part because even though the market is safer and more sustainable today, a mortgage is still typically the largest debt obligation for many consumers. Half of all consumers fail to shop for a mortgage in connection with a home purchase, even though our research shows that it could result in substantial savings. As the market recovers, discrimination also remains a significant risk. And at the same time, over 1.5 million consumers are still struggling to pay their mortgages while servicers continue to lack incentives for sufficient investments in customer service and compliance. In addition, investments are needed to ensure that the Bureau has the right information to prevent the next crisis and a deep understanding of the mortgage market. And finally, we believe we have an obligation to follow through on implementation of the Bureau's mortgage rules. We will achieve this goal by using our supervisory and enforcement programs to ensure equal and fair, non-discriminatory access of mortgage credit, by placing particular focus on implementation of our servicing rules, protect, protecting delinquent borrowers still suffering from the aftermath of the crisis, by ensuring that the new HUMDA rule is successfully implemented, and by continuing to work with institutions to support implementation of the rest of the mortgage rules and by beginning to assess their effectiveness over time. Our seventh goal relates to open-use credit. The Bureau defines open-use credit as any credit product that is offered without an expectation that the loan will be used for a specific purchase, such as to buy a home or a car or to finance an education. Open-use credit may be secured or it may be unsecured, and the open-use credit market encompasses a broad range of financial products, including credit cards, overdraft products, payday loans, auto title loans, and installment loans. The CFPB envisions an open-use credit market where lenders rely on business models that succeed when consumers use credit when they need it and are able to repay their debts when they're due. We believe this is important because we have learned through our research that it's possible for lenders to structure loan products that enable lenders to succeed even when many of the borrowers cannot afford to repay those loans when they're due. The Bureau has found this to be generally true of payday loans, auto title loans, and certain installment loans. In the payday loan space, according to the Bureau's research, over 80% of payday loans are rolled over or followed by another loan within 14 days. 15% of new loans are followed by a loan sequence that lasts at least 10 loans. In addition, low and moderate income households incur large and largely unanticipated costs from overdraft products. In fact, most overdraft fees are paid by a small fraction of bank customers. 8% of customers incur nearly 75% of all overdraft fees, and the median transaction amount that causes an overdraft fee is just $50. Continuing the small dollar rulemaking is a big part of achieving this goal, with the goal of finalizing that rule to protect consumers from debt traps associated with unaffordable loans. In addition, a proposal to define a larger participant rule in the installment lending market will give the Bureau greater visibility into a wider range of lending products. In addition, we will initiate a rulemaking process with the goal of developing rules to make the overdraft market fairer and more transparent and our supervisory enforcement work will complement this rulemaking activity. Our eighth goal relates to small business lending. While most of the CFPB's focus is on credit markets that serve consumers, Congress also directed the Bureau to monitor certain aspects of the market for small business lending. Small businesses, including those owned by women and minorities, are critical engines for economic growth. The CFPB envisions a small business lending market where fair lending laws are enforced, and where communities, government entities, creditors have access to the data needed to identify the businesses and community development needs and opportunities of women-owned, minority-owned small businesses. This goal is important in part because the small business lending market is vast and complex, with a market size of $1 trillion serving over 28 million businesses. In addition, existing research suggests that significant discrimination against minorities may exist in the small business lending market. 
Currently, no federal agency collects comprehensive data on small business loans. We will achieve this goal by building a small business lending team to begin market research and outreach for a rulemaking on small business data collection. Subject to an assessment of feasibility, we will build the infrastructure to intake and analyze small business lending complaints. And as part of our supervisory work, the Bureau will continue to examine small business lenders for compliance with fair lending laws. Our ninth and final goal relates to student lending, and in particular, servicing of student loans. The CFPB envisions a student lending market where servicers facilitate repayment of student debt in a manner that is consistent with consumer interests, transparent and fair, and has incentives to encourage these outcomes. This goal is important in part because outstanding student debt has doubled since 2007 to nearly $1.2 trillion owed by 40 million consumers. Nearly half of the amounts outstanding are not currently in repayment, and nearly 8 million student loan borrowers in, are in default, while another 3 million are struggling to make payments. Together, that accounts for more than one quarter of all student loan borrowers. We will achieve this goal by continuing to work with the Department of Education and other agencies to develop and implement recommendations that align servicer incentives with appropriate consumer outcomes. We will work through our supervisory and enforcement activity and in coordination with other law, law enforcement partners to hold servicers accountable for their legal obligations to consumers. And based on this work, the Bureau will evaluate additional policy responses, including a potential rulemaking. That concludes our nine goals for our, our two-year uh, strategic outlook. I'd like to open up the floor uh, uh, of this presentation for feedback from all of the Credit Union Advisory Council members. And specifically, we have a series of questions uh, that we'd like input on from QAC members. In particular, as the Bureau moves forward in implementing this strategy, how can we engage the QAC members to provide regular progress reports and receive their input? What are some of the ways in which QAC members can provide the Bureau with assistance in implementing this strategy? What data and other sources of information are available? What are you seeing that may help inform our work that we have planned? And what reactions do you have to the plan for achieving the Bureau's priority goals? In addition, we want to know how can we engage the QAC as we refresh and adjust this strategy over the coming years. Thank you, and I'd like to open it up for feedback now. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to give you some input for one of them. Uh, for the small business lending, while I realize that there isn't one particular agency that um, uh, collects information, you may not be aware, but the CDFI fund from the Department of Treasury actually does collect quite a bit of information on small business loans if a uh, applicant has received a grant from them and they do small business loans, they have to uh, uh, report that information uh, to the CDFI fund annually. And that information includes, you know, dollar amounts, times, terms, uh, whether it the business was to a minority, to a woman, how many uh, employees they may have hired from uh, the loan, um, census track information, and so forth. So that may be a resource to you, and wasn't sure you were aware of that. That's incredibly helpful, and we appreciate that as we're starting to learn more about the small business lending market. That'll be very helpful as we stand up our team. So, committee, uh, we have some comments, and Robin? Yeah. I think looking at this, uh, the area that it, I have the greatest concern about is the student loans um, and the amount of debt that's outstanding. I, and I don't know how we supply the information to you, but I, I daily see young people who are so far in debt, I don't see that they're going to get out of it. They're still living at home with their parents. And, you know, we're, we're, all, we're struggling all the time trying to figure out how to help those people. I, th I don't know if there's a way we can supply how we get the data to you to show just how many people may be getting denied for loans with us because they can't buy a car because they're so far in debt. So they can't, they can't buy the car, so they don't, can't get to their job. It's, it's kind of like a vicious circle. And it's something that um, we, we talk about a lot at our institution about how, we, how we're going to be able to help these people. And you do reach a point where you say, 
we are going to prove them for a car loan. Maybe their ratios are a little bit high, but that we do need to, they have to get a job. They have to have a way to earn income to eventually get out of that student debt. So I, of all of those, I'd say right now, I think that's the biggest impediment because if, you know, the housing market, they can't buy a home, they can't do anything until they, they really focus on that student debt. So anything you can do that. Look at the servicers. I know personally, I've been there with my kids, and I know that uh, Sally May had a program that if you made your payments on time after for three years, they automatically reduced your interest rate. Well, they were supposed to automatically. They don't automatically reduce your interest rate. You have to contact them. So there may be something there that we can do to help these people, at least if they're making their payments on time, that it's the burden is on Sally May to automatically reduce that payment by that 1%. Ernie? My comments are going to be more of a general nature than they are going to be targeted to any one of the specific objectives. As the only member-owned financial cooperatives in the marketplace, I think our goals as credit union executives and as credit union uh, management teams run very much in sync with the goals of the CFPB. Credit unions for years have been the good guys in the marketplace. We've said many times, and I believe that the people in the CFPB have agreed with us, that we didn't cause the problems that actually gave birth to CFPB several years ago. So as members of this committee currently, and I think future members of this committee, we're happy to sit with CFPB and share our stories of how we've been able to do things over the past years, how we're doing things now, and how we're looking forward to doing things in the future as we work every day to help our members solve these very same problems that you've so uh, nicely articulated for us. And so we look forward to being partners with you as we go forward on that project. Thank you, Bernie. I agree. Gregory, I think you had something? It's my reaction is similar to Bernie's. Um, I think we support the goals of the Bureau. Um, we're all seeking the same thing. As an institution, though, that has changed our loan operating system, both consumer and mortgage, to meet the new regulations that have come out. As an institution that's brought on two additional compliance folks to help us get through and digest and get ready to move forward, I was hoping we would see a little bit of a breath and take a break a bit um, and just digest as we go forward. But as I look at your nine objectives and look at the folks around the council, these aren't big issues to us. Um, some of them are things that we do. Arbitration, for instance. Um, I, I think a lot of us have an arbitration agreement. I, I don't think that we would make a clear-cut statement that class action lawsuits are in the best interest of our members. I think they're in the best interest of the plaintiff's lawyers and the plaintiff's bar. Um, but when I got my free coffee card in the mail as a result of a class action lawsuit, I wasn't real satisfied. But so I would encourage you to talk with us and not draw the conclusions and then try to circle us in as we get there. But uh, I think we're on the right track and there's a lot that we can agree on. Thank you. Tom? Thank you. A comment and a couple of questions. Uh, this is a, uh, a very ambitious list of priorities for a near term. Having nine, any of us that have done strategic planning within organizations, coming up with nine objectives. Um, especially in light of your current progress and status with, with many different programs, um, will be very difficult to achieve and to uh, not kill your people. But uh, uh, good luck in, in getting through all that. Um, question on the on the student loan and on the small business loan. Uh, you've identified 11 million uh, students that are either in default or struggling. Uh, have you broken those down between private student loans and uh, federal loans? A, you know, the federal loans are need-based. Anybody that needs that money can get the money. Uh, the majority of private student loans are credit-based. So do you have you looked at that to see the difference between the two? And and do you have uh, supervisory oversight over the federal loan servicers, or is that a DE, Department of Education area? I don't, I don't know how that falls. Those are both issues we can follow up with you on, on offline. Uh, I don't have that data in front of me, and we work very closely with the Department of Education in thinking about how we uh, look at the federal loan environment. Okay. And then, uh, secondly, on the uh, small business, you identified uh, discrimination as a concern or as an issue within uh, small business lending, and you talk about doing a data collection. Would that data collection focus on the issue or the problem you've identified, or would you envision? A, a larger data collection uh, process 
to gather far more information than just addressing that particular uh, identified problem. We're at the very early stages of that of that process, and actually what we're doing there is implementing a, a statutory mandate that we have under the Dodd-Frank Act to do a small business data collection. In part, the statutory provision identifies the uh, minority and women-owned owned small businesses as, a, as an aspect, but it's not limited to that. Exactly how this data collection happens and what it exactly looks like is very much something that we're in the early stages of figuring out, and we'll welcome your input in that process as we move forward. Thank you. Anyone else? David? Just a, uh, a comment and then a question. The comment concerns your uh, commitment to continue to do research on financial education, financial literacy training. I know we're all very involved in that, but whatever you can share with us, whatever you can learn so we can better educate consumers would be really helpful. I, I really like your emphasis on that, that it's still a goal. And then the, the question concerns a, a comment that's made in the mortgage section, the last one, uh, where you identify there's still one and a half million consumers that are struggling to make mortgage payments and, and are facing foreclosure. Uh, that's still a large number, but it seems to me that it's a lot smaller than it was back in 2008, 2009. And I'm wondering if you can work with uh, the GSEs, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and really encouraging them to start to restructure those loans and, and provide some relief to those uh, consumers using your influence. Because I, th I think it's now, in my opinion, a, almost a manageable problem at, at that level. And we just need to get this behind them and really help them out. I know as credit unions, we do a lot of troubled debt restructuring, but uh, we need the GSEs to step up. So. Uh, it's just a question on whether you feel that's appropriate. Yeah, I'll, I'll actually speak to both of those. There certainly has been a tremendous amount of healing in the mortgage market. It is also true that we still are not back to sort of normal levels, whatever normal would mean, because we haven't been at normal for probably 15 years now because of the run-up to the crisis, the crisis itself, uh, and then the residue uh, of the crisis. Uh, we do uh, cooperate closely with FHFA, which oversees Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, because we both do a tremendous amount of work affecting the mortgage and housing uh, markets, uh, and also with HUD. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, as the markets are healing uh, gradually, but there's still elevated levels of underwater uh, houses around the country. There's also still elevated levels of defaults and foreclosures in certain parts of the country, although in some markets that has largely healed. Uh, there, are, we, we discussed this a bit, but inventory problems in a lot of markets, uh, both because of those problems and also, uh, because of, uh, uh, home builders have been slow to come back in. They, they lack confidence, uh, as, as they, you know, had to work off uh, the residue of the market uh, crash. So those are things that are affecting the housing market going forward. But we have put uh, regulations in place, a number of them uh, specified by Congress. Many of them we had some discretion about how to, how to tailor uh, the rules uh, that help protect the mortgage market going forward from some of the things ever happening again that happened uh, before. On, on financial education, uh, what I would say is the Bureau has worked now over several years to develop some terrific tools and resources that are freely available. Nothing that we do is copywritten uh, and therefore uh, uh, not, not copyrighted, and therefore anybody can use them, anybody can distribute them. If I were a credit union, I would look to uh, use our tools with your members. Uh, there are moment-in-time tools uh that have been discussed about issues like paying for college, owning a home, uh, uh, planning for retirement. We have the Ask CFPB set of frequently asked questions and our best expert neutral answers, all of which can be socialized with your members, whether they are interested in, say, debt collection or credit reporting or anything in particular. Your, your employees may not be expert in all these areas, but they can utilize these resources. Uh, and 
uh, that's something that we would strongly encourage. The financial advisory that's going to be discussed in a moment is all about best practices, many of which certain of your institutions may be engaging in now, but if they aren't, they can learn from them and they can uh, implement them. We want to work together with financial institutions on financial education. Uh, and those of you who pay uh, particular attention to the welfare of your members, uh, if you want to use our tools, if you want to co-brand those tools, uh, all of those things are strongly encouraged by us, and we would, we would be glad to help facilitate that. It's for financial education, I think you are aware, but United Way has four pillars, and one of their main pillars, one of those four is financial stability and education. And I, I don't know if you've had a chance to partner with United Way, because there are people who aren't currently using the un, unbanked, and I think that they are trying to get into churches and get to people to help provide financial education, and hopefully maybe with a partnership with United Way, with that being one of their priorities, would, be, would benefit both would benefit everybody. Yeah, I actually worked with United Way on financial education and, and homeowner issues and the like when I was Attorney General and Treasurer in Ohio. They are a, a partner that we have worked with around the country. We're working with libraries around the country as well. Uh, and the Your Money, Your Goals uh, uh, resource that we have utilized that, that is being utilized by social service providers, labor unions, legal aid groups, uh, and a variety of of providers now volunteer groups such as uh, not entirely volunteer but charitable groups such as United Way uh, and and the like. Um, the uh, other thing that um, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the other part of your of your comment there, but um, uh, again, uh, we mean these tools to be used by others and distributed widely. And credit unions would be a great partner for us. And one of the things we've liked uh, that credit unions do around the country is you're very active in promoting reality fairs, reality days, programs for young people who role play what it's like to be out in the world on their own, uh, looking after managing their affairs. And that's very eye-opening for a lot of young people who are going to be doing this a few years later, but ought to be thinking about it sooner. Uh, and we, we very much, uh, we very much, uh, uh, appreciate that program and encourage you to, to be doing more of it. Yes. Uh, just as a follow-up on the reality fairs, after doing these for about two and a half years where we're headquartered, uh, we have become, for in one of the counties where we are at, we have become the, the middle school curriculum for financial education in the middle school uh, for the entire county, and we're working our way forward in the other counties in which we serve, and it's a great because the school systems are, are strapped for money as well, and they don't have the expertise to teach this subject, so they they are becoming more and more willing to allow that to be outsourced uh, to us, and it is extremely eye-opening when you uh, when you walk in and deal with seventh graders, uh, and, and this is the first time they've even uh, had this subject even discussed with them. I, I've been dealing with the reality fair program for about. 12 years now, going back to when I was a local official, uh, I think it's a great thing for those school districts to encourage institutions to sort of come in and bring their expertise. Some school districts are very reluctant to do that. I think they're wrong, uh, those those that are reluctant, uh, and I'm glad to hear that that's uh, changing. My, my children went through a Reality Days program in their school district uh, uh, in Ohio, and thought it was really valuable. Uh, my son, I, I remember saying that uh, he didn't think anything that he learned that day was particularly difficult, but he couldn't imagine going out in the world and not knowing any of it. But many young people do. Yeah, you, you sort of have to prove to the school system that the education is the real reason you're there, and it's the first reason you're there. And once you do that, uh, then their buy-in uh, uh, is pretty rapid after that. Uh, uh, the other question I have is on the is, is on the debt collection side. Um, I, I know that, that you you differentiate in your in your document here about first party or original creditor versus third party uh, creditors, but um, I, I would encourage you to gather as much information as you can from us on uh, succinctly the two groups of borrowers or or, or people who are in collection issues. Because they're pretty much divided into two large groups. Those who can't pay, 
and those who will not pay. And uh, we, we need to be careful that, um, uh, that we don't restrict our abilities in either of those groups by having one um, sort of directive that sort of carves off some of the edge out of both of those groups so that we're limited in one aspect about what we can do to help versus what we can do to actually fairly collect the, the debt that's owed to us from that borrower uh, who hides from us, who hides the collateral, who um, refuses to pay but has the wherewithal to pay. You can, you, you can reasonably determine that they can pay. They're just choosing not to. Uh, and then on the other side, you have the member who has had a, a catastrophic event in their life and now they can no longer, they can't pay under the original terms and conditions. And we are perfectly willing that if you, if you will communicate with us, we can help restructure that so that you can pay, which helps both the credit union and it helps, uh, their credit because we, we, we rearrange the terms in such a way, uh, where they can pay on time instead of paying late. Uh, so be, just ask that you be mindful of that on the original creditor piece. Thank you. I think communication is the key to success in most things. I just have one thing. We need to turn this back over uh, so that we can uh, be educated on the next uh, part of the session. But as far as credit reporting, um, again, being CDFI, I do a lot of alternative credit um, type of things. I know that you know, two of the things that we look for on a pretty regular basis is a 12-month history or 24-month history for rental payments as well as uh, looking at insurance. Uh, payments. And I know insurance companies pull credit and have their own little way of pulling credit, so why shouldn't they have to report payments? And I think many of the large rental companies out there should also report too. I have seen a few. Just food for thought. All right, so. All right, that was a wonderful transit um, discussion, so now we're going to transition uh, into a discussion on how credit unions can protect elderly customers from financial exploitation and abuse. So I'd like to invite Stacy Cannon, Deputy Assistant Director, and Naomi Karp, Senior Policy Analyst from the Office of Older Americans. Stacy and Naomi. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank the Council for including us in your meeting today. We are delighted to be here to have this opportunity to tell you about the advisory and report that Director Cordray um, told you a little bit about earlier in his uh, remarks. The Bureau released the advisory yesterday, so the timing is impeccable for today's meeting. Um, and actually, today um, is not the first time that we've uh, briefed the Council. In fact, we were here about a year and a half ago when we were at the early um, uh, exploratory phase of the project and uh, we reviewed our notes from that meeting from a year and a half ago and we were reminded how um, helpful that meeting was and we received excellent feedback and for those of you who may have been on the council then uh, perhaps you'll see some of the things we talked about at that meeting actually in um, the advisory and in the report that accompanies it. Um, before I turn things over to my colleague Naomi, who's going to walk you through the recommendations that are included in the advisory, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about our Office for Older Americans, in case some of you are not familiar with it. Uh, we are one of the four special population offices uh, in the Consumer Education and Engagement Division here at the Bureau. And uh, we essentially engage in policy and education initiatives that are designed to uh, to one, help older consumers navigate uh, important financial decisions as they age, and secondly, to help them, uh, to help protect them from unfair, deceptive, or abusive practices, and to help themselves, help them protect themselves as well. Um, combating financial exploitation has always been a very important priority for us, and we think that the advisory that we released yesterday. Uh, takes us into an important area and um, is an important step forward in that effort. So um, having said that, I will turn things over to Naomi. Um, one other thing, actually, before I do, sorry, Naomi. Um, I, uh, regarding the uh, consumer education, I just wanted to mention that on consumerfinance.gov, or please feel free to contact either one of us, we have an array of consumer guides 
and reports that I think many of you will find helpful and useful, and we are delighted to share those with you too. So now I'm going to make Stacy do the clicking, and I'll walk you through this. And thank you, Director Cordray, for the great setup with your remarks. Um, so what I think that I'll try to do is go fairly quickly through some of the background on older Americans and elder financial exploitation so that I can then um, spend a little bit more time on the actual content of the advisory. Um, we actually issued two documents yesterday. One is a very concise advisory that has all of the high points of our recommendations. The second document is called Recommendations and Report on the Same Topic. It's quite a bit longer, but it's very meaty. It has a lot of good stuff in it, a lot of elaborating on the things in the advisory, so we're really hoping that you will take a look at both of them. Um, so let me just walk you through a couple of quick data points on older Americans to set the stage. Um, and the director already really um, gave you the background on the demographics. Um, it's also important to note the net worth of older adults, and I'm sure that you're all aware of this from your business. Um, so in 2011, the net worth of households headed by a consumer age 65 and older was about $17.2 trillion. So that is actually a lot of money out there in the hands of older Americans, even though their incomes may be reduced um, they do hold the wealth, and that's part of actually what makes them vulnerable because the scammers and the predators out there know, um, you know, like Willie Sutton said, that's where the money is. So, so their net worth is actually somewhat of a problem for them. Um, in terms of their banking habits, again, you probably know that they are very, very highly banked um, or credit unioned as well, as I should say. Um, because um, they are more highly banked than any other age group. So over three quarters of households headed by a consumer age 65 and older are fully banked, which means that they use banks and credit unions. They don't use alternative financial services. Um, and the other key point, and this will lead into some of our recommendations, is especially those over age 70, they are very, very likely to rely on tellers as their primary form of banking, which means they're actually in the bank or the credit union. Um, you guys get to know them, and you get to see what's happening, and they're coming up to you, and you know they're telling you things that should send up some red flags. So that's part of what provides an opportunity and makes you such important actors in this sphere. Another thing that I think we're all aware with the aging of the population is cognitive status. Um, diminished capacity or diminished cognitive abilities really impacts people's ability to handle finances. Financial capacity, the ability to manage money and property, is the first type of capacity to go. Um, even with mild cognitive impairment before Alzheimer's or another dementia, um, people start to lose that ability to manage money, and part of that means losing their ability to judge whether something is a scam or a fraud. So cognitive status is, is very important. It also means that a lot of people um, need surrogates to manage their money, and we'll touch on that a little bit as well. Um, so elder financial exploitation, just so we're on the same page, a very simple definition of it is the illegal or improper use of an older adult's funds, property, or assets. Um, as Director Cordray said, it is the most common form of elder abuse, and um, unfortunately, it's very highly underreported. Um, so in terms of the statistics, it's very hard to measure. Um, somewhere in the realm of about 5%, according to the academic studies, um, that's probably a gross underestimate. Um, when older adults are surveyed, they actually report much higher incidences. And actually, again, in terms of timing is everything, actually just two days ago, the Investor Protection Trust released its updated version of the 2010 statistic that you see here. They repeated the same survey again. Um, and again, well, the number went down from 20 to 17 percent, but it's really close to one in five older adults, 65 and older, are reporting that they've been scanned or taken advantage of financially in one way or another. So 
that's a very significant number. Um, and as I mentioned, it's very under the radar. One study said only one in 44 of those cases ever makes it to an agency that can actually provide services to the victims. So that's very troubling. Um, a sister agency, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, or FinCEN, that I know you're all familiar with, which is part of the Treasury, um, issued a very important advisory in 2011. They wanted to stress that financial institutions can really p play a key role in addressing elder financial exploitation. So they highlighted that the filing of SARS, for instances of elder financial exploitation, is very valuable. Um, as I'm sure you know now, SAR filing has become electronic. And on the electronic SAR form, there's actually a category, a checkbox for elder financial exploitation, making it easier for you to designate that. It's still very important to have a narrative and to provide um, a lot of information about what you think happened and what law enforcement should be looking for. Um, just a quick slide, this is FinCEN data. You can see that since 2012, the number of SARs filed by depository institutions has really gone up very substantially, whether that's because of FinCEN's advisory or because of the greater prevalence of this or just greater awareness. We're not sure, but a lot of financial institutions are, are filing those SARs. Um, also, the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, did a study in 2012 on elder justice, um, particularly highlighting elder financial exploitation. One of their findings was that banks, and I will extend that to credit unions, are, are very important partners in combating it because of their position, um, and that they learn from adult protective services and law enforcement that frequently, at least at that time, it was underreported by banks. So they actually made a couple of recommendations to us, to the CFPB. Um, one was to develop a plan to educate banks on how to identify and report. Um, and to some degree, this advisory and the recommendations we issued yesterday are a response to that, although we were already very much thinking about how to do that. Their second thing was they wanted us to clarify that under privacy laws that you still may report to authorities. Um, and we had heard frequently over time that there was confusion about you know, is there a conflict between the privacy laws and the ability to share that non-public personal information when you think that an account holder might be um, subjected to suspicious activity? Um, we, with seven other federal regulatory agencies in 2013, we issued guidance saying that, in general, you may report elder financial exploitation without worrying about running afoul of the graham leach Bliley Act. Um, and we reemphasize that again in our advisory that we just issued, and we are sure that you're probably aware of that, but it's something that we're still trying to get the word out to financial institutions across the country. Um, so I think I jumped ahead of myself, and my next slide talked about the guidance, and so we can move on. Um, so as you heard yesterday, we issued the advisory and the report um, which are basically to identify what we believe are best practices to enable you as financial institutions both to prevent elder financial exploitation before it happens and then to intervene effectively, promptly, in a timely way when it does occur. We hope that you will consider these recommendations as you look at your own practices. We hope you will get ideas from them. Um, that you're not doing that you may think are good ideas to implement. Some of them we hope you'll say, oh yes, we're doing that already, but maybe we give you some more food for thought. Um, we do need to point out that this is not regulatory, it's not binding on you, it's recommendations, but um, again, we hope that you will take them very seriously and, and consider them. So let's just walk sort of um, as quickly as I can through the areas of the recommendations, and they're divided into about six categories. Um, the first is kind of general. It's about protocols. We think that you need, uh, financial institutions need to have a comprehensive, organized, and clear way to attack this problem. So we want to recommend to you that you have internal protocols 
and procedures that are clear, that can be communicated to all of your employees. We understand that there's a huge variation between a small credit union or a community bank and some of the largest banks in the country, some of which have specialized central units where they have dedicated staff and they're triaging cases from all over the country. Small institutions are not going to be doing things like that. So we recognize that you're going to want to adapt these protocols depending on your size and the risks that you face and the needs that you have in your community. So we recognize that it's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, so moving on training, we think training is really critical, and especially as we talked about um, tellers and frontline people um, playing such an important role. Um, they need to be trained. They, they need to be trained on the red flags. They need to be trained on some tips of when they see a situation and maybe they can do something to stop it, what are, what are some scripts for them? What are questions they might ask of an account holder who's coming saying, I want to wire $10,000 to Jamaica because I won the lottery and if I just pay my fees up front, I'll get my million dollars and my son will get the Cadillac. And so scripts, which mm -hmm. happened to my mother's friend, um, so scripts that will help them perhaps raise the consciousness or, you know, get them to come back with a son or daughter and help to explain it and just other tips for those kinds of things. So that's part of the training. The training should also be for back office people, people who are dealing with your fraud detection software and, and just really everyone in the institution um, should, should be trained and should be trained Repeat it repeatedly. Clearly, there's a lot of training requirements, so you're going to have to figure out ways to do it succinctly and, you know, within your resources, but training is very important. Um, so moving on to detection. Well, the frontline people and the actual humans who can observe the behavior is a very important part of detection. But the other thing that we really wanted to stress was harnessing technology. Um, and we want to recommend that you ensure that your fraud detection systems include analyses of the types of products and account activity that may be associated with elder fraud risk. Um, and a key point that we make there is that um, transactions and behavior that may look normal for younger account holders may be things that she throw up red flags for older account holders. And so we provide you with some lists of some of those types of transactional activity, and we recommend that you integrate that into your fraud detection systems. Um, we also recommend clearly that, if you can, that you have use predictive analytics so that you'll be looking at each individual account holder's behavioral pat patterns so that then when you see something that's out of pattern, that again might be something that indicates a risk of some kind of suspicious activity or elder fraud. Um, so we really want institutions to beef up that technology at the back end. Um, moving on to reporting. Um, so we encourage financial institutions to report all cases of suspected exploitation to relevant federal, state, and local authorities um, we say all because you may not be mandated to report all of them, but we think it's important to have a system to report them all. Um, now on the local and state level, that's primarily adult protective services and law enforcement that you'll be reporting to. Um, clearly SARS are another aspect of it, so the FinCEN reporting. And then there could be situations where you may be reporting to other federal agencies, for example, the U.S. Postal Inspection Service or the FBI, in addition to FinCEN. Um, we want people to be aware of state reporting mandates, and um, very likely you know about them. But financial institutions or some subset of financial institution employees are mandated reporters to state, probably to adult protective services, perhaps also to law enforcement, and about half the states. In some of that half of the states, it's a very specific mandate. There's a state statute that says financial institutions must report. In some states, it's 
any person who suspects it must report. So everyone in the state is a mandatory reporter. So those laws clearly are important for you to be aware of. Um, we talked about SARS. Uh, we talked about uh, Graham Leach Bliley. Um, we have some information in there about what is adult protective services. What do they do? What cases do they take? We want to provide that information because some financial institutions may not really understand how they operate, and we also want you to collaborate with them. Um, and then we've heard some issues around when there is a law enforcement or adult protective services agency doing an investigation, so a case is already open, whether it was the credit union that reported it or someone else, and they come to you and they ask for account information or documentation. Sometimes there's some frustration that they're not getting it quickly enough, they're being charged for it, so we encourage people to expedite those documentation requests. Okay, I'm getting a little bit of a nudge here on the time. Um, so pr then we have another category we call protecting older account holders, and that really covers a lot of different things. Part of it is around um, EFTA and Regulation E, because elder financial exploitation may involve unauthorized electronic transactions. And so we have some reminders in there of particular things that might involve older consumers where we want to make sure that you're protecting their rights under EFTA and Reg E. Um, the next section, and this is something that might be new to you, and we actually heard this a lot from credit unions and community bankers. They're frustrated because they report to law enforcement or to adult protective services, and they don't think anything happens. APS doesn't have the capacity. Law enforcement thinks it's a civil matter, whatever it is, and they really want to protect this person. So they'd like to be able to go to the son, the daughter, somebody known in the community, and say, hey, we think there's a problem with your mom, but they're very worried about the privacy rules as they should be. We have a recommendation in here about developing a consent process in advance with the account holder so they could designate a trusted family member or friend and designate the circumstances under which they would want you to communicate to that person if they thought that something bad was happening to them. We think there's a way to do it and still comply with the privacy law, so we have some suggestions there. Then we make suggestions about a number of age-friendly services that I think I won't walk you through right now, but we have a good deal of detail there on working with your members on planning for incapacity. And I guess I'll take this moment. I know you're all interested in financial education, and the director is urging you to use our materials, so I just want to quickly plug a couple of them so that you know that they exist. So we have a series of guides called Managing Someone Else's Money. It's for those sons, daughters, relatives, friends who are acting as legal surrogates and managing someone's money, and we want them to do it right. So we have these four guides for agents under powers of attorney, guardians, trustees, and government fiduciaries. Um, and they are really great, and lots of financial institutions are distributing them. So. I'm happy to share these with you after the meeting. Um, we have a short handout on planning for diminished capacity and illness that is meant for the public. And then we have our Money Smart for Older Adults Prevent Financial Exploitation Financial Literacy Tool. Those are all out there. We would love to have you use them. Um, OK, moving on. So finally, collaboration. Um, this is fairly clear with the importance of working with law enforcement and APS, developing contacts with them, coordinating with them about public education and member education. And then in many places in the country, we have multidisciplinary network initiatives that you can plug into. You are experts on finances, on banking, and so forth, and often um, those law enforcement and community service providers could really use your expertise, so we hope that you will work with them. Um, so that was a really quick and dirty version of what's a lot of information that we hope that you will take some time to look at. And we did want to throw out some questions to you. Um, so we'd like to know what ideas QAC members have on how the CFPB can disseminate the advisory to reach the largest number of credit unions out there. 
Um, what are some ways that you can help us in distributing the advisory and encouraging credit unions to adopt our recommendations? Um, and finally, in this space of older Americans and protecting them and protecting their assets, are there other activities that you would like to see the CFPB and specifically our Office for Older Americans engage in that we think would be helpful to you so we could work together with you? Thank you so much. We have exactly five minutes to answer her question, <laughs> so be brief. Um, as one of those Americans who now falls under this uh, protection guideline, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, we do um, a lot of training with our staff to recognize elder abuse, particularly from, I will say, from the third parties, you know, the, you know, the scams. Okay, you've won the UK lottery. Uh, the mail order bride system out of Europe, you send $2,500 over, and when your bride arrives at the airport, she brings the cash to you. Uh, will you pick her up at the airport? All this other stuff. We've intervened, uh, gotten chewed out by the member, but we've acted on their behalf. Um, where we struggle is when the abuse is taking place within the family, and particularly if it is the joint member on that account with that elderly member, just how far can we go uh, and still protect ourselves uh, when we know there's abuse, particularly when I can't discuss it with another family member who's not on the account. So that's kind of what we struggle with. So um, <clears throat> when, when, we, when you folks talk about elder abuse and what can we do, understand elder abuse comes from many angles, okay? Uh, just like you'll find under overdraft protection and courtesy pay, it's many angles, um, uh, and then probably sometimes the best thing to do is just sit down with us and talk about what we do to prevent it within our own walls uh, th that will help you. I also want to commend CFPB for the, guy for the materials that are free. Uh, we use them extensively, not only in this area, but in others. Uh, also, that we're allowed to co-brand with it, so uh, we appreciate that. It makes us look smarter. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, then I, I thank you for that. But th that's kind of what we struggle with. As far as dissemination, uh, NCUA puts out um, circulars to credit unions. The trade associations do. Um, the leagues, uh, the corporate credit unions do. Uh, there's a lot of sources that we can we can get that information uh, to the credit union. So I'll shut up. Great. And I just can I just quickly reply that. Um, we're very aware, and we do make it clear in the advisory and the report that we're not just talking about those stranger scams. Mm -hmm. the, the, the prevalence really is much more in those trusted people, the mm -hmm. family members. Right. We also recognize in our report the dangers of joint accounts. Mm -hmm. We hope that um, institutions will actually warn people when they're opening them about some of the risks of mm -hmm. them. Um, we encourage them to offer convenience accounts or multi-party accounts without right of survivorship because those might be safer for people and to explain those kinds of things to the members. Bob? One approach you might consider is um, providing us presentation materials. We, we, we have good luck bringing members to uh, evening seminars for different topics, Social Security, retirement planning, those kind of topics. Uh, we feed them, which also helps with attendance. <laughs> But putting the materials in front of them as good as they are, people don't read them until after it's almost too late to let them experience the problem. But I'd be more than willing to, if you were to give us a PowerPoint or a deck that was all the same documentation material in that, um, we would do multiple seminars a year and we would fill the room every single time. Yeah. And I will point out, although it's not the 15-minute thing, but the Money Smart, it's actually, it's a train-the-trainer module, and so there is an instructor guide and there is a PowerPoint. Um, the whole thing is 150 minutes of content, so you're not going to probably do that at one of those sessions, but we recommend to people that they can break it up into, you know, bite-sized pieces. So that is one resource, but we will think about ways that we could do more concise things and share them with you. Right. Um, okay. So with respect to your first question you had there about the ability for the CFPB to reach the largest number of credit unions um, and provide them with information for training of their members, I belong to a group called the Credit Union Compliance Professionals who meet in Southern California once a month 
and we have representatives from 65 credit unions coming together. So that would be a good place to, um, to reach a lot of credit unions at one time. And I know there's a similar group here in D.C. So those kind of groups are around the country, and they also many times are linked to the leagues. So they sponsor them. So that might be a, a good way to get a lot of credit unions at once. Great. Absolutely. Does anybody else have a comment? Have you uh, developed um, account agreement language for the convenience or the agency uh, approaches you've talked about to help us set those accounts up uh, correctly uh, to give the limited uh, access to the view only the type of language or others? No, but it's a great idea for us to think about, so I really appreciate that idea. And did you bring this to uh, Western Union? Because a lot of the, the fact that these people are fully banked helps in detecting a, especially on a scam side. Because they would have no reason, I couldn't think of a reason for someone who's 70 years old to go to Western Union, which is what these scammers do. I was talking to the chief of police of the local police department this week, and he's, you know, they don't come to us because we are educating our, our uh, staff. But a Western Union outpost in a 7-Eleven or other type of convenience store, uh, not so much. So it got me to think, can we detect that transaction within our system to flag it for you know, literally immediate follow-up? Because once it's done, it's gone, and, and, they, and they move on. But so, you know, groups like the Money Transfer Company are, are people that need to be more aware of this. It's about the fourth great idea in the last ten minutes. Maybe we should extend the session a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, Director Cordray, Delicia gave us permission to extend for a few minutes. <laughs> I think that, you know... I'm one of these people now taking care of older parents, and um, I have dealt with at least uh, three times I have a mother-in-law who has dementia, and the advantage that people try to take. Um, I haven't had a chance to read through all the documentation since you gave it to us yesterday, but uh, you know, one of the things that um, we've seen in our credit union is phone call solicitations, and phone call solicitations... I know on a national level, uh, the IRS says you owe money and you need to call me back. Or um, we've actually had several instances of people calling saying that your grandchild or your grandson and they know the name of the child is in trouble and you need to send money and so forth. Um, you know, I hope that there's information on that. Those are scary things and uh, to, uh, to deal with. Um, I think all of us are very passionate about this and you know, we really care. It shows kind of the passion we have overall as an industry for our members. We want people work hard all their lives for their money, and they deserve to be able to keep it as long as they can. Does anybody else have some great ideas to share? No? She gave us extra time. All right. <laughs> I know, I know. You guys are good. You are good. Well, I want to thank everybody for this uh, great discussion. Uh, we got some great information, great advice, and so forth. Uh, I'd like to thank Delicia and uh, Zita for uh, helping uh, coordinate all of this, and Director Cordray for always being here and allowing us the opportunity to speak our minds. We do greatly appreciate that. And uh, since I know that this is the last session for a few of you in the public session, uh, good luck and uh, farewell. I know we'll be talking over the phone, but uh, we won't get to see each other here again. So thank you, and thank you for a great audience, and I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the day. We'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting.